Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the operating systems workshop. Um, and yeah, let's learn about how your computer works. Okay, before we start, we want to introduce ourselves. My name is Haley, Haley Kim. Um, I go by she, they pronouns, and I'm a third year computer science major here at UCLA. Um, I'm Eric, I'm the other workshop lead. Um, I also go by she, they. Uh, I'm a third year computer science major, environmental systems and society minor at UCLA. And we have our lovely volunteers with us today. you would like to say hi. Uh, hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a freshman at UCLA and I'm currently studying mathematics and computation. Hi everyone, I'm Alara. I'm a fourth year computer science major at UCLA. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm a third year computational bio major. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Hello, hello, I'm Vivian. Uh, I'm a second year computer science major at UCLA and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Yes, so please feel free to message our volunteers for help at any time, whether it be a DM or in the main chat. What we're hoping you'll gain from this workshop is basically a base understanding of what operating systems are um, and what types there are out there. And uh, we're trying to get you to familiarize with a very important tool, the Linux operating system, which we'll get into the details of later. Okay, I know the phrase operating system kind of sounds scary, but it isn't all that, and we'll get into it. Okay, for today's agenda, um, we just went through our white icebreakers. Uh, we'll go over what an operating system really is, and then why should we care about operating systems? What do they do, including scheduling, which Eric will go over, and then we'll go into our lengthy interactive demo about how to use a Linux operating system. Okay, so I'm going to start us off. Um, does anyone have an idea of what an operating system is? If not, that's totally fine too. We just wanted to see if anyone had a background or something like that. Yeah, you can just unmute yourself, chime in. Earn some sure. points. Um, well, if you don't mind, uh, I guess my understanding is that you know an operating system is the core program of a of a, of a computer, and uh, you know there there are a lot of different parts to it, but uh, one of the most important parts is like a, like a kernel, um, something where you have uh, an interaction between hardware and software, and uh, you know uh, it's the basis for all other higher level programs to uh, run, I suppose. Yeah, that's totally right. Um, that's that's a very good idea of what an operating system is. So next slide. So um, just a little more background, a computer has two parts, the hardware and the software. So the hardware is your physical laptop, the materials that like make up your device, while the software is the code that helps your computer um, actually function. So the operating system is kind of the bridge between this software and hardware. Um, so it is the software that communicates with the hardware um, that enables other programs to run. So every desktop, computer, tablet, smartphone includes an operating system that provides basic functionality for the device. Um, while each operating system is different, you know, like Mac, Windows, those are some of the more popular ones. Uh, most provide a graphical user interface, um, which is basically the ability to see your screen and what you use to interact with your laptop. Um, it allows you to manage files, make folders and all of that. Um, so you can also install and run code written for the operating system. And this is actually what software developers um, capitalize on. Um, and they use that to create applications and programs for themselves and other users. Okay. Um... Going into a little more detail, um, you've probably heard of a couple. It seems like you have a solid idea of what an operating system is. Um, Mac and Windows, as Erica said, is the most popular. And, uh, but the third one, Linux, might be a bit foreign to you. 
um, that's okay. We're going to talk about it a little more before delving into it and using it and seeing what it's really like. Uh, for now, you can just kind of think of it as a third kind, the more silent and less commercial type that engineers often use on a day-to-day -day basis because of how useful and powerful it is. Um, and I guess the most familiar image uh, you might have of it is one of those really old tiny computers with a black screen and a blinking cursor with no icons. Um, because Linux is actually an open source operating system, which is which quite literally means that the source code of the operating system is open to the public. Um, on the other hand, Windows and Mac operating systems are closed source because they're owned by companies like Apple and Microsoft, and we can't really get a peek into how it works unless there's some illegal leak uh, from inside the company. Um, so this kind of difference between open and closed source is related to why you've never heard, what why you've heard of and seen Windows and Mac systems, unlike Linux, because uh, Linux doesn't really come pre-installed as a laptop's operating system when you first buy it, since no company is making money off of it. It is downloadable, though, and some of you may have them on, your, on computers. OK, so you can think of operating systems as a sort of high-level brain of a computer, like Bruno mentioned. Um, it's a little different from the embedded systems inside simpler machines like microwaves and ATMs, since those machines have really simple, repetitive jobs. Um, just think about the sheer number of things you can do on your laptop. You can attend this workshop, you can browse the web, you can play games, you can write an essay. Uh, it's just incomparable to the choices of buttons you can press on a microwave, which only lets you do very certain specific tasks that have already been laid out for you. Um, are there any, any questions so far before we move on to why operating systems are important? Just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Cool, seems, seems like we're on the same page. Okay, moving on. So why are operating systems important? Like why should we learn about them and why should we care about them? Um, it's mainly because um, they essentially make using a computer much easier than it would be without one. Like it delegates work for you so that all you need to do is tell your operating system, hey, I wanna write an email to this person. Um, instead of having to control the actual memory bits and wires inside your computer to do it all yourself. Um, in this scenario, without an operating system, anyone who wants to use a computer would essentially have to be a programmer, which is how it used to be in the past. And that's why computers weren't as widely used in the past, um, because it was simply so difficult to use them. There was a very steep learning curve. Um, and essentially, the operating system is a middleman between you, the hardware, of the, you and the hardware of the computer. And it's been improving so much in the past few decades that now you need very little of a technical background to be able to simply use a computer. Um, okay, let's let's think of it this way: like, imagine how hard it would be to get a burger from In-N-Out if there were no cashiers, like no cashiers at all. Um, you would basically have to go behind the counter yourself like tap the person manning the grill, like how many patties you want, the assembling person, like how you want your burger to be assembled, pour your own milkshake, et cetera. Um, and it would become a hot mess really quickly since In-N-Out is always so crowded and popular. Um, so essentially the cashier is what the operating system is. It's your communication link that delegates work after asking you what you would like. And they make your trip to In-N-Out so much easier. Um, also, the presence of these cashiers stop random people from simply not paying, uh, stealing money from the counter, and taking other people's burgers. Um, so it improves security as well as making it easier to use. Um, and essentially, that's why we care about operating systems. We want to better them, and why want to make, make better ones out there because it makes usage easier and safer for everyone. Okay. So Haley touched on all of those processes that the computer has to do that you as a user might not be aware of. Um, so a process is just a job that your computer has to complete. Um, and it can vary from like the, just updating the time on the screen to simply downloading a file. However, for the most part, your computer can only work on one process at a time. So 
what should your computer do if it has multiple jobs that it has to get done? Um, if you have any ideas, just unmute yourself and say an idea. When those wrap up ones. Oh yeah, if you guys like speak up, um, you guys will be entered in the raffle more time. Wait, really? Oh my God. I am, a, uh, I, I think there's a, an area actually of, of computer science that deals with um, how computer, how processing units should prioritize different, um, well, processes that a computer has going on at any given time. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but if that's anything that you were looking for, maybe. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, there has been a lot of research done into um, seeing how a computer should order their processes so that it can work as fast as possible. I'm sure we all get annoyed when your computer takes like a second to load something. And so it is really important. Um, yeah, so next slide. Um, so there are several scheduling algorithms out there um, to order these processes, all of which um, having their own sets of advantages and disadvantages. So the scheduling algorithm is just how uh, the computer decides to order their processes. So we're going to take a look at a real life like scheduling problem and its corresponding solution to help you guys understand a specific algorithm that we chose. Slide. Um, so in this scenario, um, a cashier offers each customer a certain amount of time to check out their items. And so if a customer isn't done with their items by the time set by the cashier, the customer has to go back in line and wait. So as you can see, each customer can only spend a certain amount of time at the cashier before the cashier moves on to the next customer. The cashier iterates through the line, spending an equal amount of time with each customer and so this ensures that no customer spends an absurd amount of time waiting to be checked out, guaranteeing that every customer gets fair and equal treatment. Next slide. So that's actually an algorithm called round robin. Um, the computer, so this algorithm, kind of like I said um, in the previous slide, prioritizes fairness, giving every process an equal amount of CPU and similar wait times. The CPU is just um, what, um, what executes all of the processes. Um, so we're gonna go through another example to sort of help you guys conceptualize this even more. Next slide. So let's say we are the head chef of a kitchen and the restaurant is super busy and we have a lot of incoming orders right now. Um, using the round robin scheduling algorithm, in what order should we cook the meals? This is like very similar to the cashier scheduling problem. So if anyone has any ideas, let them you know. Okay, so Edward said five minutes per meal, first in, first out. And that is exactly right. Um, yeah, so happy to see you understand the round robin. Um, so yeah, uh, like he said, we would work on each order for a specified amount of time, in this case, five minutes uh, before moving on to the second one. We would work on the second one for another five minutes uh, before moving on to the third order and so forth. And we would just continue that until there are no more orders. Uh, next slide. So um, does anyone see kind of any drawbacks or disadvantages of using this algorithm? So maybe there, there are some processes on your computer that are more important than others and should have more CPU time. Yeah, that's right. Some processes should be prioritized over others. Um, and that's not something that round robin takes into account. Does anyone else have any other ideas? Some things take longer than others and they may be more important. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially if it's a process that's super important, but if it takes longer than the allotted time, then it then that process is gonna take a long time to complete. So yeah, like you guys mentioned, round robin will take longer for processes and jobs that take longer than the set amount of time. 
And this is because the process has to wait for the computer to finish working on every single process before the computer can go back to that original process that needs more time. Um, are there any other ways that your computer might be able to schedule its processes? By importance? Yes, that, yeah, that is actually um, another scheduling algorithm. It's called priority and every task is assigned like a number like one through five and like let's say one is the most important then the computer will always work on like ones on processes with one first and then two and then until five. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have other ideas? As we said, prioritize smaller tasks. Yes, that's actually another algorithm called shortest job first. Um, and it just works on all of the smallest tasks first and leaves the longer tasks um, for the end. Um, there's also one called first come first serve and it's just like the name says, whatever process comes in first, that's the one that's gonna be worked on. Um, and yeah, those are the main ones. So you guys got most of them actually, um, and yeah. Cool. And now um, I think we only have the Linux emulator activity left, uh, but before we dive into it, uh, let's cover some basics. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page before we start using a kernel um, in case anyone got confused. Um, so this is super basic, but just laying it out there, um, the difference between folders and files and how folders are sometimes called directories. Um, and folders are essentially just bags that holds different files. And files are what you're accustomed to, whether it be PDF or Word document or a JPEG. Um, it's any form of data that you interact with and you need. And folders are just a way of organizing them in your computer. Um, just to give you like a quick graphical representation, um, sorry. Uh, this is how my desktop looks. Obviously, there's folders out here that, that's organizing different things for my classes. You can always create new folders, and inside folders, you can always create new files, whether it be a text file or a Word document or whatever, and then save it into that folder so that you can come back to it later. Um, and we'll be dealing with this, but on a command line prompt once we start the Linux activity. And a little bit about the command line prompt. This is, as I mentioned before, how computers used to look before we got the GUI, so graphical user interfaces. And um, the little header um, before the dollar sign and your blinking cursor is what we're interested in because that tells you um, who you are, your own username, the name of your device that you're working on and the directory you're currently in. And as you can see from the second picture from the top, um, my name is Kaylee Kim. I'm using my Mac Pro. And after the colon, it shows me where I am. And the squiggly line means I'm home. And then the slash means that I'm inside a directory from home. And desktop is where I'm at. And then I can keep going further down and down into different folders. As you can see from the picture right below that, I'm inside a folder called grocery bag on my desktop. And then a folder called fruits inside grocery bag inside desktop. And this will, um, be relevant for our activity that we'll go into. Um, any questions at all about all the terms that I threw out there? I said a lot of words. Okay, I think we're good. So moving on. Yeah, so our like final activity that we'll be doing after talking for so long about what operating systems is and what they do is actually trying to interact with like a command line prompt Linux kernel um, because I'm sure you guys are familiar with Macs and Windows and how to work with those, but Linux might seem a little strange for you since it's more of a developer and engineer tool rather than a commercial tool. So um, let me just drop this link in the chat for you guys. One second. Okay. And it should load up like it's loading up for me on the right side of my screen. 
Um, it's going to skew a lot, a lot of words out there, but they don't really mean much just for the moment. Okay, um, I'll give you a couple more minutes to get set up or like one minute. And please unmute and ask us if there's any technical issues you're facing. We're using this emulator instead of your local terminal on your um, computer, because if you use a window system, it doesn't really resemble a Linux machine. So it's kind of a third party platform for us to try things out. Okay, could you guys give us a reaction, a thumbs up or anything once you're set up? Okay. I think we're good. Okay, so we'll be doing like a very quick run through of simple but very essential commands on the Linux kernel. As you can see, they're all laid out here on this PowerPoint in case you get lost. Um, they're verbatim, so um, you can just type them in as you see them, and they are case sensitive. So if you write capital letter LS, it will not work. It'll skew some error out, so be careful about that. Computers are quite dumb when they get, when you don't give them the right command. Okay, so now that you're on the kernel and your header, your prompt says slash root, that means you're in the computer as a root user. Um, let's try the very first command, ls. So you type ls, enter, and yeah, you don't really need your mouse for anything. Um, the whole point of the command line prompt is that you can simply look at your keyboard. So ls is basically just seeing what's what's on the computer right now where I am. And right now you're at home, you're at the very top of the directory chain and you're trying to see what files are on my computer. Obviously this is not a personal computer, this is an emulator, so it won't really have much in it. There are two test files um, and nothing else. Okay, does everyone understand how, what LS is, how it works? Okay, moving on. So we're gonna try to attempt to create a folder like on the graphical user interface, it's quite easy. You do the right click mouse and then you click on new folder. Um, on the command line, there's a specific command you run, mkdir, and I'm going to name mine Explore Tech LA, but feel free to name yours whichever you want. So the command line prompt isn't very nice in that it doesn't really give you any feedback once you run a command. It just, it's kind of silent afterwards. So you will kind of have to check whether your command run, ran by yourself. Um, so right now, after I ran NKDIR Explore Tech LA, when I run LS one more time, I should be able to see that there's this new folder that's been created with the name Explore Tech LA. Okay, now that we've successfully created a folder, let's try going into that folder. So the command to do that is called CD. It's not the disk, it's change directory. Um, computer scientists are very lazy and they don't like to type things out. So CD explore tech. Oh, a new person is entering the room. I think she left by accident. Let's see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so CD explore tech LA. You have to put in the folder name exactly as it is. And as you can see, my little command line prompt has changed from root to explore tech LA. It's showing me that I'm currently residing in this directory that I created. Um, and let's try maybe another LS here, just to show that this is a new directory and there's nothing in here. And then, okay, now I'm in the explore tech LA folder, but what do I do from here? Like, can I get back out? How do I get back out? So there's these shortcuts in the Linux kernel, dot and dot dot. Dot means the current directory where you currently are. Oh, and here is. And dot dot means your parents. So you're actually able to escape one level um, above where you are, where you came from. So if I do as number four says cd dot dot, I should see myself go back to home. And this is how you navigate. It's more primitive than looking around in the GUI and clicking things and clicking the back button, but it does the job. Okay. Let's go back into our folder where we have nothing yet. Here, we're gonna to try to attempt to create a new file without using a fancy app like uh, Microsoft Word or anything of the sort. So these Linux kernels um, usually come with some programs pre-installed, but these programs aren't really programs that 
the regular layman is very comfortable with or is even aware of. So this simple program, a text editor, just like Word, um, is called VI. Um, it's on number seven. So VI is the name of the program. And then you're going to put in the name of the file that we'd like to create right now. Um, for our purposes, I'm going to next uh, name mine test.txt and press enter. You should see your um, entire screen change. Um, if you guys are following along, could you please give me a react like a thumbs up? Just don't want anyone to get lost. Cool. Yeah, and this may seem like a very strange environment for all of you if you haven't worked with Linux before, but it's quite crucial in terms of um, coding, developing, and programming later in the future. And I remember I was super jarred by all of this when I first came to college. So hopefully this is a nice little introduction. Okay, now we're in this, now that we're in this weird text editor, we're gonna try to write something in it. If you try now, if you just hit your keyboard, it probably wouldn't work. Um, you're gonna have to type in I for insert, and that will get, in, get you into writing mode instead of viewing mode. That's seven A right there. And then for seven B, you can literally write whatever you want. I'm just gonna scribble things. Hello, my name is Haley. Uh, and that's gonna be what's in my text file. Feel free to write whatever your heart's desire. Okay, and then now that we've written into our file, we wanna stop writing. So press the escape key. And then um, now you wanna save this file, right? We want it to go away. So you're gonna do colon WQ as 7D says. And that is short for write and quit, I believe. So yeah, so it should save the file and um, get you out of that text editor into your original folder. Okay, and as number eight says, let's try ls one more time. And there we go, we have a file now in our folder. Amazing. Okay, now that we've created this text file with so many more steps than you normally would, um, let's delete it. Let's delete it. Okay, so the command to delete things is rm or remove. And you're going to do rm and then the name of the file that you've created, rm test.txt. And don't forget the space in between. And then it will again tell you nothing about what they did. So you're going to have to check for yourself, ls, okay, and the file is gone. Okay, we've just completed step 10. We made a directory, gone into the directory, escaped the directory, created a file in that directory and removed the file from that directory. Okay, so let's go back to home. CD dot dot is something we've seen before. And we still have the folder, but the folder should be empty now. And now that we're, we've done all this uh, stuff, we're gonna delete the folder that we created ourselves. Um, and that's rmdir, same as rm, but rm directory and explore tech la. Now this command will only work on empty folders. If you have a folder with something inside of it, you're gonna have to uh, use the rm command with different flags and we won't get into that for now. Okay, and once you type in ls again, our computer, our emulator should have returned to its original state where it doesn't have anything but the two test files. Um, yeah, and these are all the navigating, creating commands we have for you. And the very bottom, um, top and PS are related to processes and what Erica was discussing earlier today. Um, it's to check what your computer is running, what your computer is doing at the moment. Um, let me show you guys here. Yeah. So top is short for table of processes and it's task manager program. Um, yeah. It doesn't really show anything interesting on the emulator, obviously, because it, the emulator isn't really doing anything. But if you have a Mac by any chance, if you run that same command on your terminal, which should be a little black icon, that will show you what your computer is doing. Let me show you guys how it looks on my end here. Okay. If I run top. There are so many processes that are happening, um, which explains why scheduling is so important and why it can go wrong in so many different avenues. Um, because even when I'm not really doing much on my computer, there's um, a bajillion processes running all the time in the background. Okay. 
And the next command is uh, PS. I won't demonstrate that here. It's very similar to pop, a little less interesting, um, but it displays um, your currently running processes. And you can try them on the emulator too. It just won't give you much information because it's not really running any uh, processes in the background. Um, but yeah, um, that concludes our activity. Are, are, do you guys have any questions of any sort? We are, we still have about uh, 10 minutes to go. We'd be ha happy to answer any questions you guys have. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So you've said before that Linux um, it like lends itself to programming and uh, computer science, but how exactly would you say it does that better than Windows or Mac? Uh, sorry, could you speak up a little more? I think, uh, uh, is this better? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, you said before that uh, Linux is better at computer science and programming than Windows and Mac. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what makes you say that? Yeah, uh, let me elaborate a little more. Um, it is the Linux environment, the kernel environment is definitely more crude than the GUI provided by Mac and Windows. Um, but simply because they're not geared towards like whether it be web browsing or gaming or other things that personal computers are responsible for. Um, and because you don't have to go around clicking things, which arguably that takes more time than learning the shortcuts on the keyboard, um, the Linux environment is usually capable of going through larger batches of programs, larger things, and very complicated tasks can be uh, strung through together into like a one line command to execute uh, different programs on different files. So usually um, in a lot of the computer science classes and even later at the job for software engineers, uh, they end up using the Linux environment for testing, for developing, et cetera. Yeah, I hope that answered your question somewhat. Cool. Any other question? It doesn't necessarily have to be about operating systems. It can be about computer science in general. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, now that our like, scheduled workshop has concluded, um, feel free to leave um, before the next workshop starts. Um, and you can always stick around for more questions. Me and Erica will be here until the end of our allotted time. Um, so yeah, um, it was great seeing you guys. I hope you took something home from this workshop and learned a little more about what operating systems are. And hopefully I'll see you in some of my other workshops for this event. Thanks. <laughs>